Welcome to Sex Savvy, where nothing is off limits. I'm Kimberly Resnick Anderson, your host and creator of Sex Savvy. I've been helping couples and individuals achieve optimal sexual health for more than 25 years. I am ready to share my unique insights and sex positive approach with the world. We'll talk about hang ups, kinks, fantasies, and function, what's hot, what's not, and most importantly, how to become sex savvy. Hi, welcome to this week's episode of Sex Savvy. I'm your host, Kimberly Resnick Anderson. I'm going to do things a little bit differently today. And before I dive into what I think is a very informative episode, I want to do a little plug for some of my upcoming episodes because I'm so excited to release these shows. And I just want to give you a little teaser so you know what's coming down the pike. I'll be releasing soon an episode on uh, BDSM and other fetishes. And I'm going to have an interview with an amazing dom a dominatrix who will speak about her work and some of the psychology behind dominance and submission. Can't wait for you to hear that show. I'm also going to have a show soon on male child sexual abuse. And I think that that is a very underreported and under discussed topic for a variety of reasons, which I'll explain in the episode. I'm also going to talk in that episode about a concept called covert incest. And I'm excited to announce that I'll have an interview that day with the host of the Mental Health Happy Hour podcast. It's, it's going to be a great show. I also have an episode coming soon on pelvic pain or sexual pain. We'll be discussing the medical treatments for that, how to diagnose it. I'll talk about what pelvic floor physical therapy is. I'll introduce you to dilators, vaginal dilators. We'll talk about the psychological impact of pelvic pain as well. And then I have an episode coming out soon on trends in dating in the big city. I'm going to talk about some trends here in Los Angeles, and I'm going to have a couple of single young adults on my show to talk about hookup apps and dating and what they're running into out there in the trenches. So yeah, that's all coming soon. But let's get back to today's episode. I think I mentioned recently that I am getting such great emails and voicemails from my listeners. You guys are sending in the best questions. And I decided to change things up a little bit today by answering some of your questions early in the show. So I'll be reading questions from two listeners, and hopefully their stories will speak to you as well. I'm then going to be talking about two sex-related disorders or conditions. The first is a postcoital headaches, sex headaches. You may never have heard of people getting headaches uh, during or after sexual contact or with orgasm, but I'm going to talk to you about this condition and whether or not it could be serious and how to know when to go to the doctor for an evaluation. I'll also be talking to you about a debilitating condition called post-finasteride syndrome. I'll explain what finasteride is and how this syndrome manifests and how it's ruining thousands of people's lives. I'll be giving you some symptoms of each condition. I'll be sharing some statistics, discussing treatment options. And of course, I'll be addressing the clinical impact sexually and interpersonally. So I will, of course, have a sex IQ quiz. Welcome, and let's get to it. I'm going to officially begin today's episode with an email from a listener named Emily from New York. Emily wrote in, is it true that couples that don't always have penetrative sex have better sex lives? Well, Emily, you must be a smart and intuitive woman because indeed, Couples who do not rely exclusively on penetrative sex not only report higher levels of satisfaction, but also lower rates of sexual dysfunction as well. It makes sense if you think about it. Couples who need or rely on penetration in order for sex to count are putting themselves in a very small box with a rigid and narrow repertoire. On the other hand, couples who are open to a variety of 
stimulation styles have flexibility and creativity, and they're giving themselves more tools at their disposal. So think of needing to build something and all you have is a hammer. Well, someone else has a hammer and a wrench and a screwdriver and a drill and a saw, right? So who's going to have an easier time building something? The couple with just the hammer or the couple with all the other extra tools? So couples who take the pressure off of penetrative sex actually can be more playful, use humor, and alleviate performance anxiety in men who feel the pressure, the responsibility of penetration keenly, and it allows them to use their hands or their mouth or a vibrator or a dildo or a variety of toys to pleasure their partner. And it's not just penetration that will be acceptable. So yes, Emily, couples who can change it up and use all pieces and parts and and uh, toys available to them will have higher satisfaction. And if you listen to my episode last week, you'll know that many women, up to 80 or 90 percent of women, need clitoral stimulation to have an orgasm. So penetrative sex isn't even necessarily going to get them off. It's the oral and manual stimulation of the clitoris where it's all external and there's no penetration at all that often brings the most satisfying orgasms to women. I'd like to read an email now to you that I received. And in the subject line, the heading was dead bedroom. I received this email from a listener named Stephen. He wrote, good morning. I stumbled upon your podcast yesterday morning while looking for something to listen to while I was at work. After listening to the episode, I decided to email you about my situation in hopes that you will discuss it on a future podcast and that it will help me and others in the same sort of situation. My fiancé and I have been together for close to eight years. When we met, we were each begrudgingly living with our parents, not sure that this matters. But early on, she confided in me that she was a dialysis patient and waiting for a kidney transplant. This meant that she spent long hours on dialysis several days a week. I didn't see any issue with this. It was just part of who she was. I was falling for her, and this was part of the package deal. We spent a lot of time together and were intimate as often as possible. Hotel rooms are expensive. We learned a lot about each other, including my learning about her kidney condition and that everything involved in being a dialysis patient entailed, or so I thought. I even offered one of my kidneys for her, was tested, but sadly not a match. We had so much in common that we couldn't believe it. Same favorite foods, sports teams, TV shows, seemingly everything. We moved in together after a number of months dating. Everything was great at first, including our sex life. However, before too long, our intimacy was less and less frequent. When I asked her about this, she told me that when her kidneys were removed at age seven, her adrenal glands were also removed. She told me that the adrenal glands are necessary in order to have a sex drive. She told me that she knew that I had needs and promised to take care of those needs. She also told me that she quote, sucks at initiating sex, so I would have to be the one to initiate. I said, okay. So we continued on our journey with me being the sole initiator of sex. All fine and dandy, right? Wrong. Most of the time when I would try to initiate intimacy, she had some sort of excuse to say no. Either she was too tired, stressed due to bills, or just life in general, or some other excuse. We would have the talk every so often, always with the same result. She'd say, sorry, I know I suck, or I'll try to get better. This would usually be followed by what felt like a pity fuck and another month with no intimacy at all. As you can imagine, this took a great toll on my ego. I felt unwanted, even though she would tell me that it wasn't me she didn't want, it was just sex that she didn't want. I had a solution for this problem. If I don't ask for sex, I can't get shot down no shot to my ego. So that's how it's been for almost five years. My ego is okay, but my wrists suffer from tendinitis. I love her. I'm in love with her. 
and I want to spend the rest of my life with her, but I can't live the rest of my life like this. I'm certain after listening to your podcast that you can help me. Hope to hear from you soon. Well, Stephen, first off, thank you for entrusting your story to me. There are so many thoughts swimming through my head as I read your email. This the dynamics that you bring up in this one email, I could speak to for an entire episode. I could teach an entire day on the themes based from your questions. So um, this is such a meaty and rich question, and I feel privileged that you are allowing me to share it with the world. First of all, I want to tell you that Wanting and expecting sex in a relationship is healthy, appropriate, and normal. I talk to lots of guys who feel ashamed or like a bad guy for wanting to have sex. And I'd want to just get that out of your head right now. You have nothing to apologize for. Expecting and wanting sex to be a consistent part of an intimate relationship is a reasonable, completely understandable expectation. I imagine something that you might be confused about, Stephen, or even potentially resentful about, is the fact that when you first met your fiancé, you and she had hot sex. There was no trouble at that time. She was interested and responsive and enthusiastic, and she seemed to enjoy sex with you and was appropriately responsive and satisfied. So when you later questioned her about her lack of desire and she offered you the explanation of having her adrenal glands removed at age seven, well, her adrenal glands were already removed when you met her. So perhaps that didn't ring true to you as a legitimate explanation because of the early good and frequent sex that you experienced. But let me tell you a little bit about the power of a new relationship. I think I mentioned in a previous episode that dopamine is the neurochemical, which is the foot on the gas of the sexual car. And one of the main things that we can count on to activate dopamine is novelty. Novelty is anything new or different. And sexual novelty, i.e. a brand new partner, is going to definitely hit that dopamine bar. So I suspect that your fiancé was really into you and excited, authentically aroused and excited about exploring a sexual relationship with you and getting to know you, and that that was legitimate and authentic. I'm in no way suggesting that she misrepresented herself to you. Although I've heard many men report that it feels like their female partners misrepresented themselves as sexually responsive and uh, having uh, a high sex drive. And then once they got engaged or married or had a baby, that disappeared. And some men feel duped or resentful by the fact that these women may have misrepresented their relationship to sexuality. But I suspect that your fiance was, you know, genuinely interested and motivated and responsive and valued that sex in the beginning in a appropriate and important way. I want to commend you, Stephen, for the fact that when your fiance initially disclosed that she was waiting for a kidney transplant, that that wasn't a deal breaker for you. I think for a lot of men, that would have been a deterrent. I think they would have run for the hills. And the fact that it didn't discourage you from seeing her as feminine and beautiful, I think, speaks to your emotional and sexual intelligence and also to your character. I have treated hundreds of men and women whose partners are diagnosed after they're committed, after they are married, for example. They're diagnosed with some sort of acute or chronic illness, and it's tough 
obviously for the patient, the one with the diagnosis, but for the partner, it can bring up all sorts of secondary complications. And sometimes they end up de-eroticizing their partner or desexualizing them because they see them now as ill or broken or sick and are no longer able to perceive them as a healthy, vibrant sexual partner. So the fact that that was not an issue for you, again, I think puts you ahead of the pack. Conversely, it's not always the partner who desexualizes the diagnosed patient, but sometimes it's the patient him or herself that tends to desexualize their own identity. And especially when someone is diagnosed as a young child, I think there's a sense of urgency and existential crisis that they are forced to contend with precociously that leaves them feeling like they don't have the luxury of participating in certain social rituals and traditions. For example, I treated a woman who was diagnosed with a rare form of leukemia at age nine, and she would say that while her friends were over at each other's houses having sleepovers, she was having chemo or radiation. And she said, wouldn't it be nice if, you know, whether or not I got invited to a sleepover was my biggest problem. I treated another woman in a wheelchair who would say instead of dancing at homecoming, you know, she was going to PT to learn how to walk. I've talked to men with MS and all sorts, you know, spinal cord injuries and so on, who as children felt unmasculine um, and not strong, and this had a profound effect on their sexual self-esteem. So I wonder if your fiancé has fully explored the impact of her kidney condition on her overall sense of femininity and in particular on her sexual self-esteem. So perhaps she's rocking it. Perhaps um, this hasn't impacted her sexual self-esteem at all. That would be fantastic. I hope that I'm wrong. But based on the hundreds of people I've worked with, there does tend to be a legacy around this issue of feeling not strong, not healthy. And I wonder if that in some way could be exacerbating the dynamic between you and your fiance. I think the strategy that you shared in your email about stopping the initiation of sex was certainly creative. Um, and I think it was protective because it reduce your risk of getting rejected, right? If you don't take a risk, you can't get rejected. But I think it also shut down any opportunity to work on the sexual relationship. So your fiance had already told you that she, quote, sucks at initiating and that that was going to be something you would have to be responsible for. And you were fine with that. But then you stopped initiating. And correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen, but I doubt that you had a conversation with your fiance about this. I suspect it just sort of happened without any renegotiation or discussion. And I think that when that happens, a couple tends to collude and not acknowledge the elephant in the room. And then here we are, five years later, with no sex at all in your relationship. And I think that it's very easy for this to happen. I have patients come and see me, couples, and they say, we haven't had sex in four years or nine years or 25 years. And people, maybe you are listening right now and you're hearing this and going, that's outrageous. That's crazy. That's insane. Who could be in a marriage that long and not have sex? Well, I'll tell you that there are 40 million Americans right now in either sexless or low sex relationships. And it sort of sneaks up on you guys, it takes on a life of its own. I'm actually going to have an episode dedicated specifically to sexless marriage and sexless relationships. But what I would say to you, Stephen, is that it's time to have a conversation with your fiance and talk openly and directly about your sexual needs, expectations, preferences and to be curious about what the barriers are for her 
Maybe she wants to have sex and she assumes that you don't want to have sex since you stopped initiating and she doesn't want to put you on this spot. So she's not bringing it up. You don't know what's going through her mind. I could come up with all sorts of potential scenarios and I've seen them all in my office. I've seen everything you can imagine and things you probably can't imagine about why people are not engaging in sex. So Stephen, I would say that even though you love her and you're in love with her, that I would strongly encourage you to address this issue before you officially marry. And I would be happy to talk with you and your fiance for free for a complimentary 30-minute session to see if I can get that ball rolling for you. So, how sex savvy are you? Let's take this week's Sex IQ quiz and find out. It's time for this week's Sex IQ quiz. Here we go. Question number one. It's a multiple choice question. Which of the following increases a woman's chance of experiencing orgasm? A, watching cat videos. B, eating a pickle. C, changing the sheets. Or D, putting on socks. All right, let's go through these one by one. A, watching cat videos. Although watching cat videos can be fun, it has no impact on a woman's capacity to achieve orgasm. B, eat a pickle. Well, the answer is not B, but research does show that eating pickles have been shown to reduce anxiety. So if you're feeling nervous, you might want to eat a pickle. C, change the sheets. I've had a lot of women say to me that when they change the sheets, they're less inclined to have sex because they don't want to mess up the sheets. So C is definitely not the answer. The correct answer is D, putting on socks. Research shows that women have an easier time achieving climax if their feet are warm. So if your feet are cold, consider grabbing some socks and you might have a better orgasm. Okay, question number two is a true-false question. The question is, there are a subset of men who would be better off not to witness the vaginal birth of their children up close and personal in the delivery room. Well, it's commonplace now for a partner to be in the delivery room, and unless a woman's having a C-section, the partner is often down at the foot of the bed witnessing the miracle of birth. I have seen uh, a number of men in my clinical practice who were traumatized by witnessing the so-called miracle of birth. It was very de-eroticizing for them to see their wife in that state, to see her swollen labia, to see the hemorrhoids sort of flying out of her butt when she would bear down. Some men can't get the smell of labor, of the blood, of the placenta, of all the fluids out of their nose. I treated a man who every time he got close to his wife after he witnessed the delivery of his daughter would smell the afterbirth would smell the blood and the fluids and it would make him nauseous every time he got near his wife's vagina. So he was clearly traumatized by witnessing the birth of his daughter. For some men, it's just not hot. It's not sexy and it's not beautiful. It's gross. And although most men do appreciate the opportunity to witness that and, and, experience it as a miracle and have no problem sexually, there is this small cohort of men who, by the way, tend to have anxiety issues or be prone to traits of OCD that for whom witnessing birth can be uh, quite unhelpful. Okay, question number three. According to Pornhub, which of the following types of porn was most popular based on search entry queries in 2018? A, girl-on-girl -girl porn, B, threesomes, 
C, hentai, or D, bestiality? The answer is C, hentai. For those of you that have never heard of hentai or don't know what it is, it's a sub-genre of the Japanese genres of manga and anime. So think anime with overtly sexualized characters and sexually explicit images and plots. So as you can tell, based on this Pornhub statistic, interest in hentai is exploding worldwide, especially in the United States. And it's generally legal and safe. But there are some subgenres of hentai, such as loli and shota, that are really pushing the envelope in terms of getting very close to child pornography. There are some DAs around the country that are wanting to include hentai or certain types of hentai into the category of child pornography, which, by the way, is a federal felony. And if you get arrested for it, there are mandatory prison sentencing guidelines. So if you're into hentai, enjoy, but be careful that you're not looking at anything depicting children or you could end up in serious trouble. We've all heard comedians reference the classic, not tonight, honey, I have a headache, as a sort of universal and iconic excuse for avoiding having sex. But did you know that sex can actually cause headaches, postcoital headaches, or coital cephalalgia is a type of headache that is experienced in the skull or neck that develops during sexual activity, including masturbation and especially immediately following orgasm. Now, these postcoital headaches are typically not serious, but they can be indicative of blood flow problems to the brain. The men that I've talked to who've experienced this condition, and by the way, men are much more likely to experience postcoital headaches than women. We're still not sure why that is. But the men I've talked to describe the headaches as sudden and throbbing. They say sometimes it's such an intense sensation that they get nauseous and actually vomit. The headaches tend to build in intensity and they can last anywhere from one minute to 30 minutes to 24 hours to a couple of days. It could be that these headaches are indicative of an intracranial aneurysm, which is basically a widening in the wall of an artery in the head. Men and women who have a history of migraines are at increased risk for experiencing postcoital headaches. And although I said typically it's not a sign of any underlying serious medical condition, it could be uh, indicative of a stroke or coronary artery disease or inflammation. These headaches tend to occur in clusters over weeks, months, or years, and they often go away on their own. Someone might have a cluster of headaches over a three or four month period, and then it goes away on its own without any treatment. One man came to see me because he had only one massive postcoital headache and it terrified him, but uh, he never had another one. We're not able to determine why he had one on that particular day. If someone does experience this type of headache for the first time or has a history of experiencing these postcoital headaches, but it seems to be increasing in intensity or frequency, we would recommend that he or she seek a medical consultation from a physician. The specialty that this falls in the purview of would be neurology. So you would want to see a neurologist. And what we know is that 1% of the population experiences this coital cephalalgia. So if there's a thousand people listening right now, 10 of you have probably experienced this at some point in your lives. As I mentioned, men are more likely than women to experience this condition. And the research suggests that the ratio is anywhere from two to one men versus women or three to one men versus women. So what are the doctors going to do if you go and see them? Well, they might do an MRI or a CT scan just to rule out any sort of serious underlying medical condition. And how do docs treat this? Well, often docs do nothing, and it seems to resolve on its own. 
But for people who cannot tolerate the pain or who have ongoing discomfort, doctors recommend an over-the-counter medication like Excedrin or Vanquish just to help with headaches. Some docs use beta blockers to treat this, and they have been pretty successful. Uh, Some doctors will use an anti-inflammatory medication prior to sex as a prophylactic to see if we can ward off the headaches from manifesting at all. There is some suggestion that these headaches may be exertion-induced. And in one study, 40% of men who experienced these headaches during sex or after sex also experienced headaches when they were involved in non-sexual exertion, such as intense exercise or shoveling snow or cutting the grass. So I mentioned this condition to you because one of my goals in doing this podcast is to just let you know about a range of sexual health concerns and disorders that are out there that might be under the radar that you may never have heard of, or perhaps you're experiencing and don't know what it is and don't know what to do. So now you know about postcoital headaches, and if you have experienced this phenomenon, please reach out and let me know. The men I've spoken to have shared a consistent theme of ultimately avoiding sexual encounters. I've probably treated about a dozen men with this condition in my clinical career. And what ends up happening is that the thing that brings a man the most pleasure, an orgasm, gets paired up or linked with something acutely painful and they end up associating sex with pain instead of pleasure, which serves as a deterrent for them. They think, well, it's, you know, an orgasm is nice, but it's not going to be worth the six hours of throbbing pain in my skull. So they opt not to have an orgasm. Sometimes they'll engage in sexual contact, but not climax, because for a lot of these men, the headaches start as they build up arousal and peak just prior to or during or immediately following orgasm. I've treated men who right when the orgasm is supposed to start and they're on that cliff of, you know, euphoric, intense pleasure, they get a stabbing pain right in their brain, right at the time that they're going to come. And it ends up that they just associate pleasure with pain instead of pleasure with pleasure. So they just stop engaging in sexual contact. Some have tried engaging in contact with less exertion to where they don't work up as much of a sweat, so to speak, or allow their partners to do most of the work, and then they can have an orgasm without pain. But others just are too afraid to risk it. They feel like they're going to have a stroke or they feel like I've had some men say to me, this must be what having a stroke feels like. And so psychologically, it's very, very scary. And you don't know whether you're going to experience this or not. Sometimes you can have three or four or five postcoital headaches in a row. And then on the sixth sexual encounter, you don't. There's no rhyme or reason to it. We haven't been able to identify exactly what's going on. So we can't predict when you will or will not experience one of these headaches. And um, it's the uncertainty as well that can be a deterrent for men when they're deciding whether or not they want to take that risk. In terms of the couple dynamic, the impact of this can be tricky. I've seen two or three couples where because the man no longer feels safe to engage in any behavior that might lead to orgasm due to fear of the headache, he'll just stop altogether engaging in sexual contact. And that includes pleasing his partner, whether that be male or female. And the partner ends up feeling a little bit neglected because they're not having headaches and they don't understand why suddenly their partner is unmotivated to please them. And what's come out in my office a couple of times is that men feel like, well, if they can't have the pleasurable sensation of orgasm, then, um, you know, why should their partner get to? So this represents an underlying dynamic, perhaps, that speaks to the um, level of motivation 
and the quality of the non-sexual relationship in terms of being invested and making sure your partner gets his or her needs taken care of, even if you're not able to do so or choose not to do so. I want to switch gears here for a moment and remind you that another reason that I created this podcast was to keep you, the people, aware of medications that impact sexual functioning and also alert you to medical conditions that have sometimes a debilitating effect on um, the phases of sexual response. So I want to talk to you now about a condition called post-finasteride syndrome. If you've never heard of finasteride, it's a class of drug. It's actually a 5-alpha reductase type 2 enzyme inhibitor that was labeled under the name Propecia to treat male pattern balding in men. It was also labeled under the name Proscar to treat enlarged prostate in men. Proscar was FDA approved in 1992 for treating the bothersome symptoms of benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is just a fancy way of saying an enlarged prostate. It wasn't until 1997, one year prior to the FDA approval of Viagra, by the way, that Propecia was approved by the FDA to treat male pattern baldness. Now, both of these drugs were approved to be used only in men. And it was in 1997 when Propecia was FDA approved that this was a game changer for guys who were self-conscious about becoming bald. And men flocked to this drug, and it works. It is efficacious in treating male pattern baldness. Unfortunately, and to the dismay of many, many thousands of men, this drug has adverse effects that can be crippling to a man's sexual health and mental health and overall physical health. Before I get into the specific description of the type of symptoms that are reported in post-finasteride syndrome, I want to say that not all men experience this syndrome, and many men have taken this drug and take this drug and have experienced zero adverse effects. However, there have been, to date, 15,309 worldwide reports of adverse reactions. So there is a minority of men who have experienced this syndrome. Some of those men have been on it for 20 plus years and others took it only for six weeks and then developed this syndrome. So it seems as if the longer you are on it, the higher the risk for developing these symptoms. But I've treated personally men in their 20s who started this medication and within weeks were already experiencing negative side effects and uh, went off the medication. Another very disturbing thing is that when men stop the medication, when they discontinue it, oftentimes the symptoms do not resolve and they remain permanent, which why it can be so debilitating. So let's talk about the sexual symptoms of post-finasteride syndrome. Well, one of the classic symptoms that men report after being on this drug is uh, erectile dysfunction. They also report a loss of pleasurable orgasm. So they'll come, but they don't feel any sort of positive or pleasurable sensation, or they lose their ability completely to ejaculate. There is uh, decreased semen volume and decreased semen force. There is often uh, penile shrinkage and numbness, as well as scrotal shrinkage and numbness. Some men report slight breast development as well, either while on this medication or even after stopping. As if these sexual side effects aren't cruel enough, this syndrome also includes other physical symptoms beyond the sexual realm, such as chronic fatigue, muscle atrophy, muscle pain, tinnitus, which is a ringing in the ears, memory impairment, and the list goes on and on. I think the aspect of post-finasteride syndrome that is 
Most scary for men are the mental health symptoms that include anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation, as well as attempted suicide and even completed suicide. In fact, to date, there are 59 known cases of suicide directly related to post finasteride syndrome. We know that the medical community worldwide is starting to wake up and warn people about this medication. And there are so far 32 studies that have been done and published. And there are more and more scientists and physicians uh, speaking out about this. In fact, today there are 35 professionals warning patients and um, the media about the impact of this medication. And now I will say that there are 36 because I have joined the bandwagon. There are 13 countries warning their populations of post finasteride syndrome. There are 254 worldwide media reports. Um, and as people learn about this syndrome, they are thinking twice about whether or not to take this medication. And here in the U.S., docs haven't done a great job of warning men about this syndrome, as some still believe it's not a real thing. But very recently, our neighbor to the north, Canada, just two weeks ago, announced a link between Propecia and Proscar and suicide. And they mandated an update in the product insert on the medication so patients would have um, fair warning. Also, in the Netherlands, uh, a, an article was published recently in their largest newspaper called Volkskrant, um, warning people to beware of this drug. In France, just last month, their version of our FDA issued new warnings to more than 100,000 health professionals. And recently, Switzerland also, as a country, made some formal announcements about the dangers of this medication. You might ask, who makes this drug and how is it still available on the market? Well, it's uh, manufactured by a pharmaceutical company called Merck. And Merck is indeed facing 1,370 lawsuits to date and also facing a class action lawsuit from men who have experienced post-finasteride syndrome and are seeking damages. As I mentioned in my episode on erectile dysfunction, being unable to reliably get and keep an erection can be very depressing for men. That sort of goes without saying. But I think for men who have post finasteride syndrome and are experiencing ED or numbness or the inability to ejaculate or some of the other symptoms like shrinkage or decreased semen volume, I think there's another layer because they chose to take a medication that wreaked havoc on their sexual functioning. They say to me, God, if I could risk now being bald or having, you know, my dick work again, I would take baldness in a second. What was I thinking? Why was I so vain? If I had known that this might happen to me, I never would have taken this drug. And um, there are so many phases of sexual response are impacted by this syndrome. It really robs a man of sexual fulfillment and sexual satisfaction. I am treating uh, a man right now who is chronically experiencing suicidal ideation as a result of having taken this medication, not only due to his sexual dysfunction, but due to the pain and the insomnia and the anxiety and the overall fatigue he had to stop working full time and give up a lot of things due to um, a decrease in his income. And he can only work part time due to his health. So he's experienced physical symptoms, sexual symptoms, financial symptoms, marital subsystem. This has just been a nightmare for him and his wife. 
And um, he said that he regularly thinks that he would be better off dead. Men have said to me, if it was just ED, I could live with it. Or if it was just a decrease in the pleasurable sensation of orgasm, I could live with it. Or if it was just some shrinkage or decreased volume in my semen, I could live with it. But I have all of those and more. Every aspect of my sexuality has been impacted And then when you add the psych issues and the physical issues um, and the neurologic issues, you can see why a man would be so desperate that he would consider killing himself. The other depressing aspect of post-finasteroid syndrome is that there's no known cure. So these guys are facing these symptoms often for the rest of their lives. And although my uh, resident medical expert, Dr. Erwin Goldstein, is innovative in trying to treat this, this condition and come up with progressive ways to reverse the damage, to date, we really haven't been able to improve the quality of not just men's sexual lives, but their overall functioning and health. I really don't want to be an alarmist. So if you're on Propecia and you are pleased with the results and you're not experiencing any adverse reactions, don't feel like you need to discontinue the drug. Don't feel like you need to rush to the doctor and get off the medication. But I just wanted to educate you so that you have what's called informed consent and are aware of these adverse reports And if you'd like more information about post-finasteride syndrome, you can go to the PFS Foundation, which is easily found online. So that wraps up this episode of Sex Savvy. Keep the questions and comments coming. And thanks for listening. You've been listening to Sex Savvy. If you find value in this podcast, please like, follow, share, comment, or review on your favorite podcast app. Your participation helps keep Sex Savvy free and available to all who are interested. Kimberly and the entire Sex Savvy team appreciate your loyalty and support.